previous talk, we talked about the staged uh, procedure and the single ventricle physiology. So we leave that single uh, uh, ventricle physiology for many, many years. What happens to the body adapting to that uh, high venous pressure that we've shared in the, in, the, in the first talk? So I'll talk to you what happens to these patients, and then we'll see how can we convert them, and we'll introduce the ventricular switch procedure that I was talking about. So just to revise the three types of fontans that we've talked, the original one is the atriopulmonary connection where the whole atrium is connected to the pulmonary artery. So there's a, like, a, a reservoir here before it gets into the PAs. And the problem with that is that there's a lot of swirling because the atrial contraction is not effective in terms of emptying the atrium. And what you get is a, a lot of currents here before it gets out into the pulmonary arteries. So with this is uh, not working so well, the surgeons came about with something called the lateral tunnel procedure, which is basically making a wall out from the IVC up to the SVC and walling out this area from the rest of the uh, single ventricle or the left atrium. Uh, so part of it is going to be is, is a plastic uh, uh, patch or a cortex, and part of it is an atrial wall. The problem with that also, we found out that it also creates hypertension on that atrial uh, wall, and the uh, increased uh, wall tension on the atrial wall will cause arrhythmia. And also there is a lot of atrial scarring by creating this patch, and then also, this will cause uh, further arrhythmias, and we'll talk a little bit about what. The third, and that's what we use now, which is called the extra cardiac conduit. That's what I've uh, shared with you before, which is an extra cardiac tube from the IVC straight to the pulmonary artery, avoiding the entire heart. So when we look at the survival of those patients with venous, venous-driven circulation into the pulmonary, into the pulmonary uh, circulation, they actually don't do. It's not ideal. If you look at the outcome at six years, uh, 30 to 40 percent would have probably not survived by then. And one of the reasons this obviously includes the initial operative mortality of the Norwood procedure, which is the highest risk of the univentricular uh, palliation. And if you, uh, we start looking at the different types of the single ventricles, there are uh, uh, better kinds than others, but a lot of them actually do have some issues going forward. And if we look at how they start uh, failing, so these are the different uh, results of the venous hypertension that happens. Protein losing enteropathy, that means that venous pressure that is subjecting, and, uh, subjected, uh, subjecting the bowels and the liver will cause the, protein, the proteins to be lost through uh, the gut and they end up having to need uh, protein or albumin replacement. Plastic bronchitis is, again, secondary to a uh, increase in the venous pressure, and it's a lymphatic disorder on the lungs. So what you end up having casts in both lungs that the, that, uh, the adult or the child would have to cough to, in order to breathe. So that also is a dangerous complication. Thromboembolism, because of what you've seen, the atrium will have uh, stasis and arrhythmias, and you'll have clots in there. Arrhythmias in the atrium, and that you've heard a lot of it from uh, Dr. Aziz, and I'll share with you some of the, uh, why these affect survival. Uh, the need of a pacemaker, uh, this is not unusual in patients with univentricular hearts. When they start, the ventricular function starts to, deter to deteriorate as well as the increasing uh, atrial arrhythmias that sometimes needs to have a, a permanent pacemaker insertion, multiple reinterventions, and last but not least, you've heard the drug-induced hepatic fibrosis, but this is venous congestion-induced hepatic fibrosis that will lead to liver cirrhosis and liver dysfunction, liver dysfunction, and liver cirrhosis eventually. And with, uh, we found that 41% uh, uh, of Fontan patients were, uh, only 41% were free of adverse effects at 40 years. So effectively, all Fontans will exhibit some sort of, an, of a venous hypertension symptom of some sort. This is uh, just some depiction of uh, the different uh, types of uh, uh, problems that you can get with the venous hypertension. Obviously, there are some calcification, large atriums, 
uh, liver uh, cirrhosis and liver uh, problems that you get from uh, venous venous collaterals and some other uh, uh, complications that happens with this venous hypertension. Atrial dilatation causes atrial arrhythmias because of the dilated wall of the uh, of the atrium, as well as there are scarring from the elevated uh, from previous surgery, as well as the elevated tension in the atrial wall, and that will cause atrial arrhythmias that would compromise the cardiac output because of the inability to deliver blood to the pulmonary circulation there by the left side of the heart. Uh, dilated atrial chambers with arrhythmias lead to uh, inefficient flow from the IVC to the pulmonary circulation. Uh, and you see here how the atrial uh, uh, reservoir is basically it sits there. It's a huge uh, chamber with a lot of swirling of blood as opposed to a, a full contraction. And that's what we see in atrial pulmonary fontans that we eventually have to treat. Does actually arrhythmia affect survival? Indeed, it does. And if you look at here, the, uh, those patients with single ventricle developed arrhythmias will substantially be at worse a survival disadvantage compared to those patients with neurorhythmias. So as a surgeon, what can we do for patients with systemic venous hypertension, chronic fontan circulation? We have to tackle them one by one and see what the etiology of this. And this is what we really, and these are all high-risk procedures, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So if we have a valvular dysfunction, so that patient, before they get to the fontan, they've had multiple operations to get to there. So we can consider a valve repair or replacement. Uh, if they have atrial arrhythmias, we need to do atrial arrhythmia surgery, which is a maze procedure. And I'll show some of the pictures of that inefficient circuit, like converting the patient who's got an atrial pulmonary connection or a lateral tunnel to a, an extra cardiac fontan to uh, allow for an efficient circuit. Aortic arch obstruction, which happens not infrequently also, we need to address that. Recruitment of the LV as a subpulmonary ventricle an unsubtitable heart. This is the concept that I was talking about. This has been developed at the Cleveland Clinic, and this is what's called the ventricular switch, and I'll talk about that uh, towards the end of my talk. Ventricular assist devices is the final, which is usually uh, done for ventricular dysfunction, possible transplantation at a later stage. So surgery in single ventricle, no compromise, no surprise surgery, because this is a high-risk procedure, and if it's not done, by a team that who does, knows exactly what they're doing, the chances that the patient is not going to do well. All cases are redo, and some, most of them would have had at least three operations. You've heard from me in the previous talk about the three stages until we get to the fontan, and some of them are more than three operations. So this would be the fourth reoperation on the heart. Sternal reentry must be planned before surgery. All cases should have at least a CAT scan. And also, we have to consider alternate site of cannulation because we might get into one of the chambers of the heart that will derail the operation if we are not ready to go on a cardiopulmonary bypass in an alternate way, compared, uh, not from the heart itself. Anatomy is variable because also it has it, it, there are multiple single ventricle uh, anatomy. Collateral management is important, and that's why we sometimes utilize cooling and lower circulation. Myocardial protection is amazingly important. If you go in into the operating room with a compromised ventricular function, you've got no possibility of losing any of that ejection fraction if you do the chances that patient will not come out of the operating room on, without, on their own heart. So that myocardial protection is important. Collaterals are there. They're going to wash your cardioplegia. They're going to warm the heart. And if that happens, the heart is not going to be protected and it's going to fail at the end of the operation. Larger adherent atrium, which we've seen because of the large um, uh, uh, reservoir, and could be the six or seven sternotomy as we were talking about. This is the classic uh, maze procedure, which is basically a series of incisions. Originally it was incisions, now we use them with cryoprobe uh, to separate the different sources of atrial activity, and we leave only the sinus node and the AV node. So there's only one track for these uh, different foci in the atrium, and we leave only the, the slower one, which is the, uh, the sinus node, which goes straight into the AV node, and that's about it. We cut everything else, or we freeze it uh, in another way. We actually uh, ablate the conduction. The different anatomies need to be known because for the surgeon, 
going in, you need to know exactly where are the lesions and how are you going to manage them. So you got to study before what was the original anatomy for that single ventricle, so you can put the appropriate lesions when you go forward. This is how we look at it. We open the right HEM when we do this. We do the freezing lesions, and I don't want to go into the details just for the sake of time. These are different uh, type of lesions that we do depends on the anatomy itself. And it does work. This is actually the freedom from recurrent arrhythmias when we do a maze procedure. The Fontan conversion. So when we have, we take down the atrial pulmonary Fontan, which is the original or the older one. They're getting less and less as we go along. We happen to do two in the last two weeks. And we convert them into a, an extracardiac Fontan. We reduce the atrium by a reduction of atri uh, atrioplasty. We do an atrial septectomy and we construct also an extra cardiac conduit and put a pacemaker in. This is how it looks at the end of the, uh, of the procedure. The reason why we put a pacemaker on the epicardial region because there are no ax, venous axis back into the heart. So Dr. Aziz will not be able to go. He could actually on occasions perforate this with the, with, in the cath lab, but most of the time we just put an epicardial pacer and put a pacemaker in the sub. Uh, coastal region of that type. These are, as I see, as you see here, there's a redo operation, they're complex. Having said that, if we go planned well, we could execute them well. Valve procedure, uh, repair or replacement is, uh, is, is, needs to be done in those patients with, with a, a failed valve or failed fontan because of the valve. And if there's any obstruction, needs to be taken care of to avoid the, uh, the uh, failing fontan. In the last few minutes, the ventricular switch procedure, which is basically the recruitment of the left ventricle as a subpulmonary ventricle in a previously unsubtatable heart or unsubtated heart. And the concept of this is that typically surgeons would say if the LV is not routable to the ascending aorta to become a systemic ventricle, we're going to just allow that heart to function as one ventricle and we will put both ventricles to pump to the systemic circulation, and we'll have just a, a, a single ventricle or a fontan physiology that would do this. So the unsubtatable heart heterotaxy patients with complex systemic and venous connections, uh, drainage or connection, and, uh, or, and in addition to the coronal anomalies, which is the pulmonary artery and the aortic uh, anomalies, traditionally being routed to the univentricular palliation, and they're being called the unsubtatable hearts. This is despite of having a tuli, two fully formed ventricles, or some of them are hypoplastic or a, 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 a smaller ventricle. So the question to the audience and to uh, anybody, who would you prefer to have is this type of physiology where you will have a, a single ventricle physiology with the RV and LV, though, although being there fully developed, to pump to the systemic circulation and have a venous hypertension and all the effects of the venous, of chronic venous hypertension, or you would you like to have a congenitally corrected transposition where you will have actually a right atrium connected to the left ventricle, left ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery, and then the pulmonary venous return comes back into the left atrium, which is connected to a right ventricle and pumping into the uh, aorta, which means that the, the, the circulation is corrected physiologically, but not anatomically. So the left ventricle becomes the subpulmonary ventricle and not the right ventricle, uh, uh, which will pump usually to the lung. Now it's pumping uh, through the circulation. And the, and the concept of this, we know that this physiology, although the right ventricle will fail in the future, but it's going to fail as a heart failure. It's not going to fail like a Fontan failure, as we spoke before, and how the venous hypertension does. So these unsubtatable hearts are uh, striving to achieve a biventricular circulation. We envision that the only solution is to perform a physiological biventricular repair, and that's what we've called the ventricular switch procedure or in other words, correct, uh, uh, creating a surgical uh, congenitally corrected transposition of, of great arteries. So uh, these can be uh, done in heterotaxy, double atrial right ventricle with a remote VST, abnormal situs, as well as crisscross hearts, univentricular hearts with unusual anatomy and abnormal systemic and pulmonary venous connection that sometimes are not amenable to septation. Why do we convert them? There's no doubt anybody with two ventricles is better than one. Chronic cyanosis has a major complication, especially seen in adults 
in adult patients. We see this slowly, but eventually it gets to the adult and causes uh, problems. Balanced circulation is not acceptable because sometimes there is an, a saturation of around 80, 85, and there is actually a single ventricle physiology, but it's called uh, balanced. And these patients get, end up ref being referred to us with strokes because their hemoglobin is above 20, and they get uh, uh, problems with uh, strokes. And obviously, we lose the ventricle-to-ventricle -ventricle interaction. So as we've seen, the, uh, almost all ventricle will fail. This is not a normal physiology. This is what's available to us when the babies are born. But if we have two ventricles, we can, or even a half a ventricle, we can incorporate that half ventricle in the circulation in order to decrease the pulmonary venous hypertension because of that ventricle has valves and the valves will tend to, to stop the, the, the uh, uh, venous hypertension. And obviously, if we are going to resort to heart transplantation, it is there, but the problem with it is that the, there's a paucity, uh, paucity of, of organs and the chance of getting a heart transplant is low. In the last minute or two, I'm going to just go through one case. So this patient has had a, uh, a heterotaxy. He's got two SVCs and two, uh, one IVC and one hepatic vein. So both open into this big chamber. There is actually an aorta which comes out of the right ventricle. There's a common AV valve, and this is the left ventricle. So the first thing we want is to septate this heart. And, and, and this patient has actually presented at age 30, which was he was thought to be unsubtatable. Unfortunately, he had a stroke because of the uh, polycythemia. So we took him in and we uh, septated him. Initially, we septated the ventricle into two and the two valves into two. And then we uh, divided, we routed the IVC and the hepatic veins into the left ventricle. And then we routed the uh, right SVC into the left SVC. Now both, all of these are draining into what's called the right atrium. Now, although it's in the left side, goes into the left ventricle, and then from there it gets connected through a conduit, which is extra cardiac, from that left ventricle into the pulmonary circulation. And we leave the right ventricle connected to the aorta, which gives the pulmonary venous return, comes from one side, goes into the right ventricle, and up the aorta, and the patient did well after that. We've done actually eight of those patients. The last thing in, uh, is basically when you're stuck with a failing fontan that cannot be uh, help neither with a ventricular conversion, fontan conversion, or one of the surgical procedures that uh, I've talked about, then we have to bridge them with an assist device and possible transplantation. The problem is that they present a major problem for transplantation because they end up presenting both with liver and heart, heart problems. And to coordinate a liver transplant and a heart transplant in those patients is not uh, something easy, and they have multiple organ involvement, and that's why they, these uh, valves do not do, these uh, patients don't do well with heart transplantation. Thank you very much.